Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a new lecture within our Jean Monnet Open Online course of European Integration, which this year is focused on economic development. We have uh, with us uh, today many students. Uh, they are um, many of them are from Chernitsi. We have a group uh, in the Faculty of um, Economy in Chernitsi. We also have a group in the Faculty of uh, History, Political Science, International Relations, a more uh, interdisciplinary faculty. Thank you also. And we also have Georgiana Paduraru and Christian Hritzkan. Thank you all very much for your presence. There are also four simultaneous connections watching us on YouTube. Uh, those who are watching on YouTube, you know, you can also participate uh, live uh, on YouTube. There is a chat and you can, you can write there your questions, your comments. And um, please bear in mind that there is a um, small uh, lag. So when you write a comment there, it may take uh, 20 seconds, 30 seconds until we can we can read it. So don't wait until the last moment to write your comments or questions. You can write uh, uh, while I talk because it it uh, it doesn't disturb. So um, welcome all those who are live on Google Hangouts and those who are watching on YouTube. For instance, Raluca Ana Maria Zaitz is on, on YouTube. She writes, hello, everyone. You must know she's my favorite student, Raluca. Yes, because she's the student that has uh, joined our course just uh, a few days ago, has been increasingly active in the course. And we all have to make an effort to welcome her in, in, in within our course. I think she will participate live uh, this uh, this evening in the seminar that we have seminar group two. Okay, <clears throat> today's topic is a really important topic because it's a foundation topic. It's a basic topic. It's about economic growth. Uh, last uh, week we were discussing economic development and we said that the um, economic growth is clearly one aspect of economic development and uh, it's uh, probably the most important aspect of economic development because even though the other um, factors that we considered last week, we said that the United Nations calculates a human development index as a composite uh, a indicator of development that contains information not only about uh, economic growth, not only about the income, but also about, for instance, uh, life expectancy or education, which says that not only uh, income matters for development, there are other factors. Yes, but economic growth, growth in output, is not only the most important component of economic development, but it is also essential for the other components to develop. Because if you want good education, or if you want good health, you need economic growth. You need to have output. There is no way to have a better quality of life without increasing the level of production. So today we will discuss this issue, economic growth. And uh, this has been a very important um, issue in, in economic science from the start, from the beginning, if you if you remember this book, this classic book by Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith is considered to be probably the first economist. 
and the the wealth of nations is like a, like a bible for classical economics and the 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 topic of the book the main interest of the book is uh, why some nations are richer than others why some some nations grow more than others and this is a topic that has been a recurrent topic in economics and it's the topic with which this year in our Jean Monnet open online course of European integration we concentrate on it we concentrate on economic development this is not only interesting from a scientific point of view for economists it's also very interesting for our students because our students come from countries such as Romania or Ukraine or other countries that are really interested in economic development because economic development and economic growth can affect and do affect their daily lives to a great extent so <clears throat> Um, this course, the Jean Monnet Open Online course of European integration, is possible because of the support of the European Union through um, through a grant uh, that is uh, uh, awarded through the Jean Monnet actions of the European Union. The European Commission has given a grant to create a Jean Monnet chair in European political economy and within this chair we have this Jean Monnet open online course so we must say this as said many times not only because we are grateful to the European Union but also for the sake of transparency it is very important for you to say who pays for uh, for the course Yes, to avoid any kind of conflicts of interest. Good. So today's topic, economic growth. Um, as I said, it's a classical topic in economics. And what the kind of issues that we will study today is, for instance, why does Romania grow faster than Spain? Why is Romania growing faster every year than Spain? Yes. Why is Romania in 2005 had 35% of the uh, EU average GDP per capita? 35% in 2005. And why does Romania in 2016 have 59 percent already this is an important question yes but also not only try to explain the past but also try to predict the future what will happen in the future how much will romania grow Will Romania grow indefinitely at this high rate of growth at 4% per year? Will Romania overcome the other members of the European Union? What will happen in the future? But not only about Romania, also it's important about for, for a country like Ukraine. Ukraine at the moment, we I think we said it, uh, last week it had 15 times less gdp per capita measured in euros 15 times less than the average uh, european what will happen with ukraine yes will income per capita increase in ukraine Will production per capita, GDP per capita increase in Ukraine? Even if we considered um, GDP per capita in purchasing power standards, taking into account the fact that life is cheaper in Ukraine, 
the difference is four or five to one with the average of the European Union. It's a great gap. What will happen with Ukraine? Well, in today's course, we will offer an introduction into economic growth and we will present some models that will help us understand what happens with economic growth and what will happen with economic growth. The models we use, the theories we use, are positive theories. They are not normative theories about what we would like it to be or what we think it should be. Yes, our models try to explain reality. And our models try to, um, they are positive models that um, predict reality. And they are not good or bad because we like what they predict or not. The test we use to verify the quality of a model is to compare the predictions of the model with reality and to compare the predictions of the model with the predictions of other models which is the best model the one that explains reality best so not it's not the one we like most the one that uh, presents us the, the uh, life in, in as we would like it to be, as Alice in Wonderland. No, it's the one that corresponds to reality best. Welcome, Lehach. We have many, many students, yes, from Chernitsy and from Yash. And also from Suchava. Cornelia is in Suchava, but Cornelia doesn't have video. If she manages to have video, it will be great as well, so that we can we can see her. Everyone is very welcome. Raluca Ana Maria Zaitz has also written again on on the YouTube chat that she is honored here in that. Uh, and also meeting all the other colleagues because we said that she is our favorite student at the moment yes okay good so <clears throat> economic growth it's about the growth in production yes that we said not only it it's important directly for development because it's an important component for our quality of life but it's also important because it's the basis for advances in other components of development as can be education health the environment whatever you like yes so economic growth is important and today we will try to understand it. and we will start with um, a simple model of economic growth that I must recognize it's a model that when I studied economics, we didn't even study this model. Uh, we started directly with other more advanced models, but this model, when, when I later started studying development economics, when I started studying the economics of poor countries, of, of poor people, uh, then this model was a very important one and they used it very much it is the harrod domar model harrod domar yes it's a model it's an old one i don't know maybe it's the, from the 20s the 30s it's the um already an, an old model of growth that tried to explain um tried to explain initially other things but it can explain economic growth. And what are the main uh, components of this model, the main ideas of this model? 
the main idea, one of the main ideas is capital accumulation. Capital accumulation is important for growth. But what is capital? Most of you are not economic students. They, you may come from uh, languages or from uh, history or international relations or from other fields. And it's good for you that we revise the concept of capital. What is capital? Capital is um, everything that uh, helps you be more productive. That helps workers be more productive. And capital includes tools, uh, it includes uh, factories, it includes what we use in the process of production that makes us um, able to produce more. If we have good tools, we can produce more than if we have bad tools. Yes? So for I, I give you an example. Imagine that you are a salesman and your job uh, consists in visiting customers trying to sell in them products. Yes? If you have to walk to visit your customers, then it, it will take you time and you will be able to visit maybe five customers per day. But if you have a car, then you will be able to move faster. And instead of visiting five customers per day, maybe you will be able to visit 10 customers per day. So uh, in this case, a car is capital. Yes, because it's something that you use in your in your job to make you more productive. Yes, the same happens uh, to us. Imagine that I am a teacher. Yes, and I I want to teach, and I and I go to Yash, and I go to a classroom there, and I have two students in the classroom i have georgiana and i have christian in the classroom and i teach the class so my productivity is that i'm able to teach two students yes but imagine that now i have a computer and i have an internet connection and i have uh, google hangouts and i have uh, youtube live and now I am able the same lecture, yes, in this in this with the same effort to teach it not only to three people in Yash, yes, but to 20 or 30 people in many different places. This is because of capital. Yes, capital makes us more productive. So capital accumulation. Increasing the stock of capital is something essential for economic growth. And all the models of economic growth, the older ones, the newer ones, are based on this idea that capital is essential to uh, make us more productive and allow us to grow more. Yes? So this is the process, what is called capital accumulation. Yes, because maybe one year I can buy a car and the next year I can buy a computer and the next uh, year I can uh, connect to the internet and so on. And my, my capital stock increases. Imagine nowadays, for instance, in the most advanced countries in Europe, in countries like Germany, yes? How they make cars in Germany, yes? They don't make them with people, with uh, screwdrivers, 
there just with one person and one screwdriver a screwdriver is also capital yes but they have much more capital they have robots they have very complex robots if you see a factory you know a mercedes factory or a volkswagen factory and you will be amazed of the 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 capital they have there and this is one of the main differences between developed and less developed countries it's the amount of capital per worker they have and advanced economies can produce more and therefore can have more income per capita because they have more capital per worker if we compare romania with for instance um, germany we said we can see very clearly the difference we said it when discussed about poverty yes we said the idea of poverty may be different in different countries there may be countries where if you don't have a car you are a poor person i don't know if you remember margaret thatcher the uh, uk prime minister that you know there's some uh, quotations about her it's not clear if she really said that or not but the the, the quotation exists that that she said that if you are 25 years old and you do not own a car then you are a failure you are a failure as a person if by the age of 25 and and you don't own a car when you think about the same thing in in romania maybe it's it you don't think that someone who is 25 and doesn't have a car is a failure yes but this is not the main point today because today we are not discussing about poverty today we are discussing about economic growth and the differences why some countries produce more than others yes and you can see that in a country where they say that if you don't have a car you are a failure it means that having a car is something normal because they do not say that the majority of the population are failures yes but in countries where you don't have it then it means that your your stock of capital is relatively smaller yes and this will have an impact on productivity and will have an impact on gdp per capita yes welcome also diana botnar who has just joined this is a very good course okay we mentioned the idea of the stock of capital we uh, sometimes i will say the stock of capital yes what does it mean it means that in economics uh, economic variables they can be of two types they can be stock variables or 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 flow variables yes if you if you say um how many cars do you have in a country or how many computers or how many factories that is a stock but you measure the quantity of capital at a given point in time yes but if you measure the increase in the capital stock in one given year how much your capital stock has grown in one year that is a flow variable yes and that is called investment so from an economic point of view investment means an increase in the stock of capital so capital accumulation is through investment 
if we want to increase our stock of capital, if we want to accumulate more capital in order to be more productive and be able to have a greater GDP per capita, what we need uh, to do is to invest. Good, that's a good thing. So why don't we invest more? Yes, well, because we can only invest from what we produce. And what we invest, we do not consume. Yes? So, um, when you produce, you have a production and you can consume part of the production and you can save other part of the production for investment and for increasing your stock of capital. And usually people can um, save a given percentage of what they produce. Maybe they, they produce 100 and they save 20% or they save 10% or they save 30% or they save 5%. Saving more will allow to invest more and increase the capital stock more. So this is the second essential element, which is uh, saving. Yes, the saving rate, the proportion of uh, the, the product that we save for investment is important for economic growth. And then there is a third factor in the Harold Domar model, which is the uh, capital output ratio, which essentially means how productive our capital is. There may be a country where they have a lot of capital, they have lots of tools, they have lots of factories, they have very nice roads, very good computers and internet connections, but they do not produce much. They, they, they will have a high capital to output ratio. They need a lot of capital to produce a given uh, amount of output. But there will be other countries that will be more efficient and with the same amount of capital they can produce more. They have a lower capital to output ratio. Yes? In the Harold Domar model, uh, it says that um, these parameters, such as the savings rate, or the capital the capital output ratio are constant they also say that the depreciation is constant depreciation what does it mean it means that when you accumulate uh, capital you have a given stock of capital but every year just by the passage of time just by the use of capital this uh, capital becomes obsolete and no longer works or need repairs, or needs to be replaced. So uh, capital, if you do not replace it, it will wear out. So this is called depreciation. So these elements in the, are already present in the Harold Domar model. The idea of capital accumulation, that the idea of capital depreciation, the idea of a savings uh, rate and the idea of the capital output ratio. And what is the conclusion of the Harrod Domer model? The conclusion is that the countries that save more are the countries that will be able to invest more and increase more the stock of capital per worker and will grow more. So saving is essential. 
So according to the Harold Domar model, why do some countries grow more than others? And say because they save more, for instance. Yes? Or it can be also because they are more efficient. In, in they, they need less capital to produce the same. Or, they, or with the same amount of capital, they are able to produce more. <clears throat> this is a, already a very important model because it tells us very important uh, factors that can affect growth. But mo the most important one is capital accumulation. Capital accumulation is the key growth, yes? And it allows you to explain why some countries grow um why some countries have greater uh, output per worker than others because they have more capital they have been able to accumulate more power the second question is why some countries are able to accumulate more capital per worker than others because they save more this is another important contribution of this model. Yes? And this model is able to explain growth and it's able to explain differences in growth across countries. Same because they, they save more. Yes? But this model has some shortcomings because it's not able to explain, for instance, why Romania grows faster than Germany. Yes? You, you cannot say it's because Romania saves more, because that's not true. There must be some other factor. Yes? And that's why new models come into place and these are the main models that we will use in this course which is called the neoclassical growth model or the solo swan growth model solo and swan were the authors that um, presented this model but it's called a neoclassical growth model it's it's a relatively new model yes from the 60s or it's newer than the harold domar model but um, it's based on classical ideas and one of these classical ideas is the diminishing returns to capital what do diminishing returns to capital mean? It means that the assumption of the Harold Domar model, which is a constant capital output ratio, the relation between the amount of capital in the economy and the output was assumed to be constant, so growth came from capital accumulation. The more capital you have, the more you produce, yes? But the Harold Domar model said that the ratio between capital and output was constant. So if you had twice as much capital, you would produce twice as much. If you had four times more capital, you would produce four times more. This is a very strong assumption. The, all the models they need to make assumptions to, 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 um, to be models because they, they are simplifications of reality. But in this case, this posed some problems, as the one I mentioned. Why does Romania grow more than Germany? It's because they save more? No. Yes? It's for other reasons. And it's because there are diminishing returns to capital. What does this mean, diminishing returns to capital? It means that if we have a number of workers, 
in one factory. Imagine we have a factory with, a, I don't know, 100 workers, yes? And we buy 100 screwdrivers from our workers. Then they will be more productive than if they do not have the 100 screwdrivers. And then we say we invest more, we buy 200 screwdrivers. And then they will be more productive because they will have two types of, they have two screwdrivers per worker. And depending on the job they will do, they choose the, the, the perfect screwdriver that they need for the job. And then we say we invest more and we buy three screwdrivers per worker. And now they will have even a more specific screwdriver for what they need to do and they will be more productive. Yes? But when they have three screwdrivers per worker, they will not be three times as productive as they were when they just had one. And there will become a point even that when they already have 100 different screwdrivers per worker, if you buy 101, it does not make any difference in production. Production does not increase at all. So this is called diminishing returns to capital, that when we increase the capital stock, productivity will increase, production will increase, yes? But to a lower extent every time uh, uh, when we increase capital. You can apply the same example to any other kind of investment. You can think of agriculture. If, if you are a farmer and you have some basic tools, you are more productive than if you have to work only with your hands. If you have a tractor, you will be even more productive. But if you have two tractors or three tractors or four tractors, Yes, you may be more productive because when one of the tractors doesn't work, you can uh, use the other one and you don't waste time while you are uh, repairing the, the other tractor. Yes, but production does not increase as much. There are diminishing returns to capital. And the neoclassical growth model takes this into account, that there are decreasing returns to capital. And this can explain why Romania grows faster than Germany. Why? Because in Romania, the stock of capital, as we said, is much lower. And that was a bad thing initially. We said, wow, but this means that we will not be as wealthy in Romania as in Germany. That's true. But what's the good thing? The good thing is that uh, <clears throat> our investments will be more productive than in Germany. So by increasing our capital stock a little bit, we will be able to increase our production much more than the same capital increase would uh, increase production in Germany. Okay, is this clear so far, Georgiana? Yeah, it's clear. I understand what you said by now. Okay, this is very basic thing, yes, but uh, we, we, I think it's very important, yes? The Harold Domar model, okay, the, the idea that capital accumulation is important and that saving is important. Yes, the neoclassical growth model retains those ideas but introduces the idea of diminishing returns to capital. Yes, we cannot grow 
indefinitely by increasing our capital stock. And one of the reasons is because they are diminishing returns to capital. Good. One of the other reasons is depreciation. It's not only diminishing returns to capital. It's the joint effect together with depreciation. Imagine that you are a Romanian, a young Romanian person or a young Ukrainian person and you get a job in a multinational company and you start uh, earning money and you start saving part of that money yes you do not consume all the money that you earn you save a part of it in order to buy durable things to or in order to invest Yes, and um, with the first uh, wages that you have in the first year, maybe you buy a car. And then with the next wages that you have in the following 10 years, you buy an apartment. Yes, and all, all your, your, your saving goes to increase in the stock of capital that you have yes it's a great thing countries like like romania they grow so much because of this because when people save what they what they save they can invest it and use it to increase their stock of capital and then they become more productive and the country grows very much yes but what happens when you already have two apartments and you already have two cars what happens then is that when you earn money monthly and you consume part of the money maybe you consume 80 percent of the money and you save 20 percent you don't consume it but this 20%, you need to use it just to repair the apartment that you have, to repair your car, to pay your car's insurance, to pay taxes for your apartment, and so on. So the more capital you already own, the greater is depreciation the more resources you will need to set aside just to keep your stock of capital constant just to replace the part of your capital that becomes old just to make repairs to your car just to make repairs to your apartment just to pay the insurance and the running cost of your existing capital And that's why a country like Germany, it's not that it saves less than Romania. It probably they save more as a proportion because they are richer and they can afford to save more. But what they save, they need to use it not to increase the amount of capital they have, just to keep it, just to cover depreciation. How about this? A hatch. What do you think about this? The hatch. The hatch. You hear me? Yes. So, what do you think about this idea of depreciation together with decreasing uh, returns to capital? It's a break to growth based on capital accumulation because. The more capital you own, on the one hand, the less productive that capital will be. And on the other hand, the more proportion of your savings that you will have to dedicate just to maintain your existing stock of capital. Yes? So this is essential in the neoclassical growth model. Yes?
I don't know if this is new for you. What did you study before? Please remind us. You you studied in international yeah. relations, right? Yeah, I don't have a lot of um, knowledge about the economics. Uh, we just we only had a course in economics, but uh, this model that you presented are new for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay. No problem. This is the idea. I just want to make the course adapted to what. Oh yeah. Okay. So so far is is it? Um, it's good, yeah. Easy to understand. Yes. Yeah, I, I was I was looking for Harold Donar model uh, on the internet to, to find more. Mm -hmm. The Harold Donar model is a very important model. And uh, the classical model for developing economies for countries, for instance, that have unlimited amounts of labor. Yes. So there, when you increase the capital, it's uh, you will always have workers coming from the countryside, from the villages, to use that capital. So if you have a factory and you um, have 100 workers and you buy 300 screwdrivers, in a developing economy, sometimes you don't worry because you just bring more workers from the countryside and you will have also 300 workers. Yes? Because the Harold Domar model is, when it was made, it was not so interested also about the, the like the neoclassical growth models. The, the more traditional, the Marx, Marxist models of growth are extensive models. They they look at the growth of a country as a whole. They care about that. They do not care so much about the growth in income per capita. And the neoclassical growth models care more about that. Yeah, and they say that the to grow income per capita, you need to grow the stock of capital per capita, but this is uh, increasingly difficult yes it's increasingly difficult to save to increase the stock of capital and this stock of capital is uh, less and less productive so what the neoclassical growth model predicts is that once an economy increases its stock of capital very very much it comes to a point that they call the steady state and in the steady state the economy no longer grows because all the savings in the economy need to be dedicated to cover depreciation to maintain the existing stock of capital. This is called the steady state. <clears throat> and the, the neoclassical growth model predicts there being a steady state. What is the good thing about Romania? The good thing about Romania is that Romania is still far from its steady state. And that's why it can still grow very much by accumulating capital. Yes? What's the bad thing about the steady state for neoclassical growth models? The bad thing is that in reality, we observe that countries grow. We observe that they are not in, the, in, in a steady state in which they do not grow. We observe that they grow. And the neoclassical growth model says that this growth cannot be due to accumulation of capital anymore. It has to be due to increases in technology, to improvements in technology. Technology means how you put together capital and, and labor in order to produce. And if you are able to 
uh, put them together more efficiently, then you are able to 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 grow even though you are in the steady state. So the neoclassical growth models, they, they are called also exogenous growth models because in these models, once you are in the steady state, economic growth is not explained by the model. That's why it's called exogenous because growth is not explained within the model. It's explained outside the model by what you call, for instance, uh, te technological growth. Yes, but this is not included in the model. And uh, that is why other models later have tried to improve on the neoclassical uh, growth model by including other factors and trying to explain growth endogenously and they are called endogenous growth models but in this course we will discuss the neoclassical growth model why because on the one hand it is easy to understand and it is simpler yes and on the other hand the neoclassical growth model is able to explain a lot of the things that interest us for instance why romania grows faster than germany or why ukraine if they uh, integrate in in the european system why they will grow faster than Germany. And this model is able to explain that, which brings us to the next question, which is the question of convergence, economic convergence. What does economic convergence mean? Economic convergence means that um well there are two types of ways to measure economic convergence one of them is called sigma convergence and it means that the disparities in 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 the output between uh, countries in in gdp per capita usually we measure then gdp per capita and purchasing power standards the, the disparities decrease and this is called sigma convergence and there's another concept of convergence which is beta convergence which means that the countries that are less developed grow faster than the richer countries as you see they are not exactly the same thing that they are intimately related and what we will discuss here is beta convergence why countries like romania grow faster than countries like austria or the uk yes this is called beta convergence and sigma convergence the decrease in disparities in GDP per capita and purchasing power standards between countries, sigma convergence is a byproduct of beta convergence. It's a byproduct of the fact that the poorer countries are able to grow faster. Yes? Good. <clears throat> but we said that the, the models that we used to explain economic growth are positive models they are not about what we would like it to be they are not normative models about what we think should be how we think economies should grow or how we think it should be a fair world or no they are positive models and how can we um, determine if a 
model, if a positive model is good, by comparing it with reality. Yes? And the Harrod-Domar model, remember it, it said that the countries that save more will grow more. And it said that by increasing the stock of capital, countries can grow uh, indefinitely and that the differences between countries can be kept forever. Yes. The neoclassical growth model says that there is convergence. But the convergence that the neoclassical growth model pro predicts is what is called conditional convergence. What are the conditions? The conditions is that countries have the same steady state. The farther away you are from your steady state, the faster you will grow. Why does Romania grow faster than Germany? Because Romania is still starting to accumulate capital and is still far from its steady state. And it grows faster. Why does Germany grow more slowly? Because they are already in their steady state. Yes? But the condition is that you have the same steady state. And what does this uh, depend on? It depends on factors that we have already analyzed, such as the depreciation rate or the savings rate or the productivity of capital, which essentially depends on the technology that you use. But technology in this case is not understood only as what popular uh, the popular understanding of technology. Technology means how you put together labor and capital in order to produce. And it can mean technology in the sense of uh, production process, innovative processes, but it can also mean, for instance, the economic system that you have. So if your system it's a communist system, yes, that is considered technology in these models of growth. Because in a communist system, it means that maybe you have 100 workers and 100 screwdrivers, but they will not produce as much as 100 workers with 100 screwdrivers in a capitalist system. Yes, because maybe in some countries the workers are less motivated or for other reasons, yes, that can affect output. So conditional convergence means that countries that are lagging behind will catch up, will grow faster than the richer countries, but this convergence is conditional, conditional convergence. Convergence that is conditional to having the same kind of economic system, the same kind of technology, the same kind of savings rate, the same kind of depreciation, and, 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 and the same kind of population growth, and so on. So when I say, that uh, Romania converges with Germany, yes? It's because Romania and Germany now are in a very similar system, yes? They are both in the European Union. And if you know the acquis communautaire, the set the, of rules, that uh, the, the laws, the regulations, that exist in the European Union, they are called the acquis communautaire, they regulate up to 80% of the economic and social life in Europe. So that's why the system, the technology is very similar 
in Germany and in Romania. And that's why capital accumulation can lead to this convergence, to this catching up effect. That's why also when I said that a country like Ukraine that has 15 times less GDP per capita and has four or five times less GDP per capita even in purchasing power standards, if they adopt a similar system, a similar technology, if they integrate, then there will be a convergence effect. There will be a catching up effect. And they will be able to grow faster than the richer countries. This is called beta convergence. Yes? And the result will be sigma convergence, that the disparities among countries will decrease. But we said that our models are positive. So we need to compare those models with reality. What has happened in the European Union? Has there been real convergence? Has it been that the poorer countries have grown faster than the richer countries in the EU? Has the gap in GDP per capita been reduced? We have empirical evidence. And we have empirical evidence to test our model. Yes? And empirical evidence says that, yes, there has been um, overall economic convergence in the European Union, and that this convergence has been very strong in the case of some countries such as uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Slovakia, or Romania. Well, that's why I, all, I also use the case of Romania as an example of convergence. Imagine 2005, 35% of the EU average. 2016, 11 years later, 59%. From 35% to 59% in just 11 years. That's very fast. It's very fast. I tell you why. It's very fast because this Kachima effect is faster from the lower, the lower level from when you start. The farther away you are from your steady state, the faster you will catch up. But this, you, if you remember, when we discussed in the first uh, lecture, I think it was the f or second one, yes, when we discussed about the single market, we discussed about um, the economic impact of European integration, how European integration affects uh, countries. And we said that uh, it was very difficult to measure because it was something that took very long. Yes? An economic convergence, according to the uh, models, the, the, the economic models such as neoclassic model can take up to 50, 70 years. So if you see Romania has closed the gap very much in just 10 years between 2005 and 2016, in the next 10 years it will continue to close the gap but not so fast, and then it will be increasingly difficult to close the gap. And overall, the overall convergence may take up to 50, 70 years. It takes a very long time, yes? Um, so this is basically 
the idea. In the case of other countries, the convergence, in the case of countries such as Spain, such as Greece, that were uh, poorer than the uh, average of the European community when they joined, there has been some convergence initially. Yes, it has been also some fast convergence initially, but what has happened is that with the economic crisis, all those advances in convergence have been lost suddenly from 2007, 2008. Yes, and that's why it's not so clear now when you look at the, at the data, it's not so clear convergence for, for those countries. If you look now at the data and the cases where convergence is very clear, it's those countries. Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Slovakia and Romania, most of which are what? not part of the Eurozone. Lehac, do you want to say something? Yeah, what about Poland? Poland has also converged, but not as much as Romania. So because when they increased the, their economic uh, growth very much. You can what you can do now because these data, for instance, I have looked at Romania's data because they were especially interesting for our students. But you have the tables with all the data of, of uh, GDP per capita and purchasing power standards for all the, the EU members and even for other countries. And you can see the case, the case of Poland. Yes? To yeah, what's, gonna, what's going to happen if uh, another economic crisis uh, comes with the... Um, with the Romanian, with the convergence, convergence rate of Romanian economic, uh, because uh, I think that our governments are. It depends, you know, what, what has happened, for instance. So, in what will happen in the future? Yes. My question. Well, it depends uh, on what Romania will do. We put Kirill in mute. Yeah. Can you hear me now, right? Yes. Good. So the, the idea is that the in the case of Greece or in the case of Spain, <coughs> the effects of the financial crisis have, have been uh, more serious than in other economies. Yes? Because they were both members of the Eurozone. Yes? And the Eurozone, uh, it's like um, central heating for the Eurozone economy. When you print money with the monetary policy that you have, the more money you print, it's like heating for the economy. In fact, when you print a lot of money, there can be inflation and you can say that the economy is overheated. Yes? When you print, too little money, it's a problem also because you can have deflation, yes? Which is what happened in Spain or in Greece. The problem with a single monetary policy, the, uh, like in the Eurozone, is that you can only have one common monetary policy for the, all the Eurozone members. And what happens when the economic conditions are different in other in one country uh, with respect to another imagine that you live in an ap in an apartment in a block of apartments yes and that you have yeah. central heating central heating is a good thing because you can buy the fuel for the heating together you just need to have a common uh, heating installation for the whole building it can be cheaper and more efficient yes but what happens if in this building <coughs> there's a strong wind, a cold wind, and that this wind affects the different apartments differently? Maybe this wind comes from the 
from the east and the apartments on the east side of the building get colder than the others and they say we should increase the level of heating but then the other neighbors in the west side apartments they say no we should not increase it because we do not want to pay more it's unnecessary because in our apartments the temperature is right if we increase the heating it will be too hot and we will spend too much and they do not agree so the effects of the economic crisis <coughs> have been very strong for countries such as spain or greece that were initially in a minority yes in deciding the monetary policy there was a majority of countries uh, wanting a more um, how do you say <clears throat> conservative monetary policy to print less money and the result was that in some countries such as spain or greece or portugal or ireland or even italy there was deflation yes and it was very bad for the economy so you say what will happen to romania in the future if there's another crisis yeah, yeah because <laughs> i think that uh, another, another crisis is coming exactly it will depend if romania is in the eurozone or not it's not okay exactly. right now it's not it will depend if they will join before the next crisis or not yes so, so romania should think twice now looking at the experience of countries like greece or like spain they should think twice before joining a monetary union with other countries that may have different conditions but romania also can do other things they can have a more flexible economic system because in the case of spain or in the case of greece the impact of the crisis has been so strong <coughs> because they have very inflexible thing systems in terms of uh, labor regulations and other kind of regulations yes and they were not so able to adapt to the crisis in, in the case of Romania, for instance, in, 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 there are some examples where they have been more flexible. Yes, it, when there was a crisis in Romania, I, I, I think I remember that the wages were reduced by 25 percent. Oh yeah, and the... in Spain they were not reduced. Yes. Yeah, it was reduced because it goes against the the law and the regulations and people have job security and people be, before accepting any reduction in 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 the wages they can take unemployment benefits yes there are very generous one yes and and uh, so in some countries the the adjustment was not possible also the european union it depends on what the european union does because the european union has felt the effect of the crisis yes you know the 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 economic crisis has not only affected the economy yes when you look now that in so many countries you have so many extreme parties yes in some countries are they are in power extreme left extreme right parties in many european countries that have yeah. as a result of the economic crisis if, if you look even today in, in spain in the case of catalonia yes oh, these, wow. these problems that we have that even you know there are sub se separatist regions in the country and so on. why now why now because of the crisis Yes, so, so, so um, the EU has uh, become aware of this problem, yes, and the EU is also trying to implement certain reforms. 
Uh, Raluca is writing also on, on YouTube. So what will happen in the future? It will depend also on what the European Union does and how the European Union gets reformed now to be ready for the next crisis. Many things have been reformed already. For instance, there the have been some uh, solidarity mechanisms created to assist the uh, uh, countries that are in, in crisis. There has been um, also a strengthening of the economic uh, and growth pact, the fiscal compact, to try to avoid the problems with the, or, uh, such as the sovereign debt crisis to, to increase discipline in order to be ready for the hard times. In other cases, uh, increased uh, flexibility is allowed also to the member states to deal with the crisis. Well, you are asking me, what will happen in the future? if there is a crisis for Romania, and I tell you, it depends, yes? Uh -huh. In the previous crisis, Romania has fared very well, yes? If it will be worse in, in the next one, it depends in which direction Romania goes, yes? If, if Romania uh, becomes uh, like Greece and like Spain or remains like more like Ireland or more like a more flexible country, yes? And it also depends about if they join the European Monetary Union or not. And it depends if this Economic and Monetary Union is reformed or not. It's not easy, <laughs> oh. but it's, it's, a, it's a good question. How about the other people in Valentina's group? Hi, can you please remove your mute? I can, I can see Oksana. Oksana, right? Yes. Oksana wants, wants to do a PhD. Uh, at my PhD, I want to investigate the question of communication, how people use uh, social medias uh, to impact uh, the, the opinion, the general opinion, and how it reflects on politics. Yes, yeah, so uh, you, know, you, you could study this in, in Bucharest. I don't know. It's Who knows? <laughs> There's a very good university in Bucharest. It's called the National School of um, uh, Political and Studies, and and it uh, has a very good faculty of communication. Oh, thank you so much for your advice. And uh, yes, if you are, that's a very interesting topic. Good. How about uh, the other people? Kritzkan, what do you say? Uh, hi, can you hear me? I have a question for you, Christian. Yeah. Um, I have revising, I have been revising the the the, the points of that people are earning on the website. Yes, for the online seminars and their participation in the teams and and I was thinking that there are some people who are very active, right? Who join the website frequently and they write comments to the seminar questions and also they read the comments that other uh, students write, yes, and they vote them with stars. What do you think about that? Well, I think the main cost is about reading the other reviews and learning what people think about it, you know. There's no point just to come out on the site and just write something and go home, you know. Basically, you have to read what everybody thinks. And I think uh, that way you could, we can evolve by knowing what other people think. Because, as I said, 
before many times uh, i might be wrong you might be right we go to agree and disagree and this way we 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 kind of learn more than just to looking in one single direction you know so basically that's, that's I think, the purpose of the seminar isn't it to be yes, able to yes. discuss uh, between yes. ourselves and also the questions the seminar questions are not like multiple choice exam questions there are questions where um, either option can be right or even both options can be of course right. agree or disagree you know and sometimes i might see uh, things from a uh, different perspective but uh, you know by talking with someone or by listening to you i might change my opinion you know that's all about courses should be uh, funny and interesting as well at the same time and you yes know, i think we yeah, should be more active and understand the is that there are some people who think that in order to earn points they just have to write yes that they earn points because of writing but they also earn points because because of reading and voting on other people's comments right because our point system is designed to encourage people to learn more together yes because we are learning together in a team our team is very large you have a team of three people but the the whole class is a team and we have now 100 people registered in this course yes out of this 183 have been active more or less yes then there are still some people that are not so active that's why it was very important for me when raluca zaitz started to visit the website and started to become active yes and i said today raluca is my favorite student yes because it's the kind of student that we should now focus our effort on people like raluca people who didn't even know how the system worked how the uh, this uh, course worked and they are uh, starting now to participate and we should help her when i wrote on the facebook group i mentioned all the people that she has in yash other people in yash that she is are part of the of her class yes but this extends to everyone the people in suchava the people in chernitsi the people in jitomir they they should also encourage people like raluca yes to participate i think she will participate uh, this evening on in in our online seminar oh we also have the group in chernitsi please remove your mute i i saw Ivan Sudintas there yeah. I'm sorry, but we should go to to the next class. Okay. And everybody leave the room. We all must leave now. Thank you <laughs> all very much for your presence. Thanks also to um, Kiri uh, from Zitomir. Thanks to Georgiana from Yash. Thanks to Lehash. Thanks to Christian. Thanks to Diana from Suchava. Thank you all very much for your presence and uh, uh, today there will be a seminar and on Monday we have another seminar group and next lecture like today on Thursday at 11.30 Eastern European time. Until then, if you have watched on YouTube, you can write your name there. If you have liked it, you can also give us a like. Thank you all very much for your presence. See you next week. Hello.